Hey girl, Marissa here. You are listening to the Codependent Dummy Podcast. As a young woman, you have been raised, reinforced, and rewarded for putting the needs of others above your own. Now, in your 20s, you're finding yourself exhausted, exasperated, and enveloped in shit relationships, especially the one you have with yourself. Codependency is a way of being where we put the feelings, wants, and needs of others above our own in an unconscious attempt to meet our own feelings, wants, and needs. Sorry to break it to you, sis, but that is not sustainable. This podcast is to help you undo all that so you can stop playing small and start taking up space. You dummy. Let's get to it. Hey, girl. Hey, it's your hostess, mostest, Marissa Selena Esquivel. Welcome to episode 83. In this episode, we will be answering, what are the common characteristics of a codependent email? And how can we stop playing small and start taking up space in our inboxes? It's been a while since I recorded a solo cast, like 11 episodes almost three months of interviews with some great guests, which I hope you have enjoyed. And I'm currently doing another round of invites. So prepare for some more solo casts in coming weeks while I book said invites. And I have to be honest, I've missed you. I've missed creating solo casts, and I've also really enjoyed spending time with the guests thus far. An update on me, I I have been slowing down and feeling good overall. I've been prioritizing sleep and rest. I am starting with a new therapist soon. And I'm also navigating family stuff. I've been experiencing the vulnerability that comes with making new friends. And everyone and their mom seems to be getting COVID right now. So there's good and there's bad. And I'm trying to be as present and as conscious to it all as I can be. If you are new here, welcome. I welcome you. If you've been here and are continuing to listen to heal from your codependency, welcome. I welcome you here. Before we dive in to today's topic, this episode's topic, I'm curious if we can do a quick check-in for you, my dear, sweet baby girl. Let's start by taking three deep breaths. All right, let's inhale and exhale. Deep inhale. And exhale, last one, and out. Just kind of roll your shoulders. Oh, you can roll your neck. My neck just cracked. Loosen up, loosen up, loosen up. And some questions to check in. Reflecting on your day up until this moment, I'm curious, how are you feeling? Reflecting on your last week, past seven days, 
What has been your general mood? What's the mood? What's the vibe? How's your body feeling in the present moment? Do you sense any aches, pains, sensations you're noticing that are asking for your attention? Are you getting your needs met in an interdependent manner? Meaning a balance of meeting your own needs as well as a healthy reliance on others to meet your needs. For example, I've been meeting my own need. I need to read. I love reading. I love books, I love reading, and I'm thankful to reflect I have been meeting that need by reading close to an hour every day. I read a little bit in the morning, I read before I go to bed. Oh, I love it. I was neglecting that need for, for a little bit earlier this year. And a healthy reliance on others, I need quality time with my husband and he has been very busy. He has been traveling and yet I have asserted and held and maintained my need for quality time. He's traveling, we call. When he's here, we spend time together in the evening. This evening in particular, we are going to go get some frozen yogurt, so that balance. And lastly, is there any aspect in your life you are failing to acknowledge that needs acknowledging? A pain, a hurt, a disappointment, a self-neglectful pattern, an annoyance? Just acknowledging it first, that's all I'm asking. We tend to identify something that we're failing to acknowledge and we acknowledge it and then immediately, what, what do I need to do? What should I do? What can I do? Just, just acknowledging it before really discerning what to do. And that is the end of our check-in. On with today's topic, the characteristics of a codepend dummy email. I have a confession to make to you all. I have been and am very codependent when it comes to sending and receiving emails. I am a codependent emailer. I have wasted hours typing and deleting, sending and unsending, compulsively replying and ignoring those physically around me since I am codependent AF in my inbox. My hope is that by discussing the common characteristics of a codependent email, you will A, become more conscious of your own codependency when it comes to email, B, you will give yourself compassion and context as to why you feel you must email this way and C, you will stop playing small and start taking up space in your goddamn inbox. I hope this message finds you well. The characteristics of a codependent dummy. Let's proceed. For starters, I am going to list the seven common characteristics 
I have found make up a codependent dummy email. Five of the characteristics make up the body of what we will term a codependent dummy email. What's in the email, the body of the codependent dummy email. And next, the, the two remaining characteristics are about the composition of said email, what it takes for us to write, what it looks like when we do write, the patterns of creating a codependent dummy email. In the body of a codependent email, you will find the five following characteristics which I'm going to list and then I will unpack. First, we begin with niceties. Second, we do too much. We do too much. Third, we do too little. We do too little in emails. Fourth, we apologize or at least have an apologetic tone. And five, we add smiley faces, emojis, or gifts to help ease tension. We begin with niceties. Why do we begin with niceties? Some examples of niceties are I hope this message finds you well. I hope you're having a great summer. I hope 2022 is treating you well. I hope you, your husband, your son, your daughter, and your dog all enjoyed that trip to the Bahamas. Those pictures on Facebook were amazing. Okay. Niceties. Why do we begin with niceties? A couple of reasons. We're scared of coming off too assertive, aggressive, demanding, stupid, informal, immature, and so on. We're scared of coming off too, too, too something. To, to something negative. We don't want to appear in a negative light. We want to ease the tension of whatever is coming next in the email. Perhaps we're sending a request, an invitation, a resignation, an update on a delay, or bad news. We use niceties because we want people to like us, right? Wow, Marissa is so kind and thoughtful with this customized wishing me well and my husband and my daughter and my son. And oh, she saw those pictures of us in the Bahamas. Oh, bless her heart. And we use niceties because we think we need to. Unlike other people who don't have to use niceties in their emails, we codependents have to be twice as thoughtful to be half as deserving of a respectful reply email. If we were able to go back to all of my email correspondence from the last decade, so from ages 24 to 34, I bet that 90% of my emails begin with a nicety, a customized nicety, 90%. That's a lot of nice introductory statements that I took time concocting and creating every time I sat down to write an email. 
The next two characteristics are two sides of the same coin. We do too much or we do too little. Examples of doing too much. We explain thoroughly why we are sending the email, why we are making the request, or we give too many options for the recipient. If we're trying to schedule a meeting with someone, we say, I can meet Monday at two, Tuesday at nine, Tuesday at three, Wednesday at noon, or Thursday at 10. And if none of this works, let me know and I can send additional times for next week. Or we give too many choices to the other party to make. We could go on a hike or we could see a movie or have a picnic or maybe go swimming or stay in and grab dinner. We do too much. Too much, it's like, oh, it's too much. Doing too much, girl. You're writing too much. You're offering too many times, it's too much. On the flip side, we do too little. We reach out to someone and say, I'd love to get together. Let me know when you have time next month. Next month, we give them a whole month, a whole 30 days to find a time that's convenient for them to meet with us. Nevertheless, we don't know whether that time will truly sincerely work for us, but we, we say, let me know when you have time next year, next year. And when trying to propose choices or ideas, a collaboration potentially on a project at work, we say, it's up to you. What would you like to do? What would you like to focus on? We have no autonomy, no authority in this dynamic. Why do we do too much or too little? I hypothesize that we do too much. No, let's start with too little. Too little is easy. We do too little because we don't want to impose, intrude, or interrupt someone and their life. And we do too much also not to impose, intrude, or interrupt by going above and beyond and making the option to meet our request, meet with me, choose a shared activity. We try and make it as easy on them as possible since we're such burdens anyways. Again, if we were to go back to all my email correspondence the last decade, just like my niceties, my emails are filled. They are chock full with options and all the explanations as to why I am making such and such a request. All the available times we could get together in the upcoming two to four weeks. I also have a habit of writing after providing options, let me know, exclamation point, which is odd since I'm already emailing the person and they hopefully will let me know. I sense it dulls the charge of the request. So it's not as tense. Let me know. I'm, I'm handling most of this, most or all of this. So you just, you just let me know and I'll, I'll continue to handle all the rest. I'm so sorry for having a need. 
And since I function in a manner where the thoughts, feelings, and needs of others are prioritized above my own, by providing all these options, I sense I'm conveying to them how much they matter, how important their time is to me, and how thoughtful I hope I come off to them in my email. The next two characteristics are all about conflict avoidance, easing the tension, doing what we can to minimize the chances of stoking our recipient's anger. Grr, ah, scary, angry monster that's potentially inside of every person we interact with. And how do we avoid this conflict? We apologize, or at least sound apologetic, and or we add smiley faces, emojis, or gifts to placate our recipient. Let's unpack. We apologize. Examples are, oh, I'm so sorry to ask, but could you resend? Da, da, da. I know it's a lot to ask, but da, da, da. Or we blame someone else and we say, oh, Greg came up to me again, wondering where the report was. Oh, so sorry, would you mind sending it? and so on. We convey a tone of apology. I am so sorry for emailing you and existing. With the use of smiley faces or emojis in the email that can look like, hi, smiley face or making an unpopular request with the upside down emoji. I noticed I use that a lot to apologize or oops or whoops or sorry, gotta ask you something, upside down emoji. I've used the eye roll to convey, it's not me asking, it's Greg. <sighs> the prayer emoji to express gratitude before the recipient has even done anything that I wanna be grateful for. The heart emoji to suggest how much I love and appreciate the other person. So hopefully they don't get mad or annoyed or bothered by my email. Gifts and memes can also help with this. I have sent messages with Puss and Boots from the Shrek series to make big baby cat eyes that are adorable in hopes that would decrease the tension in my email request. Why do we do this? We do this because we are codependent AF and conflict avoidant AF. The last thing my little codependent heart wants is to A, send an email making a request for my need or someone else's need, and then B, receive a response where the sender is rejecting, hurtful, blaming, disrespectful, argumentative, insulting, and angry that I've made such a request. 
please don't be mad at me. Adorable puppy eyes emoji is all I'm asking in every email I send. And the times when, despite my best codependent efforts, I have been met with anger, rage, or disdain in the recipient, it was so utterly painful. We will do an episode on that. So of course, of course I've done my best to try and avoid that. Of course you've done your best to try and avoid that. I have been character assassinated. I have experienced psychic deaths, like internally, I have died due to some correspondence from others I have received in the past. So of course I do my utmost to protect myself from that and you too. And if, if we look back at all my emails this past decade, you will find countless smiley faces with parentheses, smiley faces with the uppercase D, it's like a big smile, the uppercase P, which is like a, mm, like sticking my tongue up, mm, funny, and various emojis, gifts, and memes, all to ease the tension between me and my recipient. Last sub-characteristic in the body of a codependent email is we end with niceties. I say, with admiration, comma, Marissa. With much appreciation, comma, Marissa. Thank you in advance, Marissa. Please don't be mad at me, Marissa. Again, I conclude my emails trying to assuage, is that how you pronounce it? Assuage? It's a fancy word, but I like it. Assuage the other person's anger and promote their favor, adoration, and love. Now that we've covered the five traits that make up the body of a codependent email, Let's look at two characteristics of how we compose an email. First, we take too long to send an email. Second, we follow up when we haven't heard back. And third, I'm adding this spontaneously. I, in my codependency, I am very I'm a prompt responder to my emails. So let's look at taking too long to send an email. As codependents, we can take 60 minutes to write up an email that could have taken five. We write out sentences and whole paragraphs and then delete, tap, 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 tap. Or we select a whole paragraph or the whole email and boop, delete it. We move around our sentences or fluff up at the beginning or prior to making a request. We look up the meanings of words to make sure that we're using it correctly in whatever context. We take far too long to prioritize their, the recipient's thoughts, feelings, and needs while composing our email. And why do we take too long? I argue we are too conscientious, meaning we are too careful and painstaking. We are too particular, too meticulous, too scrupulous about how we are coming off to the recipient. We wanna make a good impression. 
We want to maintain our connection to them and not trigger their anger, annoyance, or disappointment. We take too long because we as codependents struggle to identify and communicate and assert our needs. If I don't know how to communicate my needs in my relationships face to face, how am I going to suddenly be able to do that via email? We don't know compromise. We don't know negotiating. We don't know a middle ground when it comes to our needs versus the needs of others. And composing an email to express a need, a request, a want, takes time for us codependents. If we look back at all my emails, I am sure the time it took for me to write all the emails I have written, all the emails that should have taken five minutes but took an hour, all the emails that should have taken 10 minutes but took 30 minutes, I likely have spent weeks of my entire life added up, weeks dedicated to the composition of emails. Let's look at following up. Codependents follow up when we haven't heard back. I send an email. For example, I send an email. I don't hear back for a week, two, three, 10, and I follow up. Hey, Samantha, I sent you an email last week about scheduling an appointment. I'm sure you're busy with the new cat, but let me know if you're able to squeeze me in sometime next week. Thanks so much, Marissa. It's like I've taken all this time to compose my initial email. They don't respond. And then I take it upon myself to have them respond. If we apply the idiom, the ball is in their court. Okay. I had the ball. I threw the ball in their court. And they weren't paying attention or whatever. Then I run over to their side of the court, grab the ball, run back to my side of the court, and then I gently throw the ball back in their court, hoping they return the ball, but offering my understanding as to why they are taking so long to do so and wondering if it's too much for me to ask them to throw the goddamn ball back. Why do we do this? Why do we follow up? A couple reasons. Maybe we really need whatever we emailed them about in the first place, okay? If it's an appointment, if there's a deadline at work, if there's an application letter to be sent. If there's a resignation letter, you're trying to quit. Maybe you, you really need that person to respond. Also, maybe we devalue our own time and sense that since the other person is so busy and important, it makes sense that we need to follow up if we want the privilege of meeting them, getting whatever it is that we need from them. I also would argue that I have followed up to gain a sense of superiority, a holier than thou emailer by being the one who follows up and reminding them and then I met with 
Oh my goodness, Marissa, thank you for following up. I've been a total irresponsible flake. You are so responsible and amazing. Yes, let's get together next week. Thanks again for being so thorough and conscientious. Yes, you are welcome. And I'm Maura Lee. And via email, more superior. Lastly, I sense I have followed up with people out of fear. If I see them out in the world and later on, and I, I send them this email, I don't hear back from them. And they'll approach me and say, hey, we never got together. Or, hey, what happened to that letter you wanted me to write? And insinuate somehow that it's my fault or my error that they didn't follow up. And then it'd be my fault and my error and then they just recognize how faulty and air-filled and unworthy I am. I follow up out of fear. Let's shift and take a look at, oh, wait, last characteristic, we promptly respond. I promptly respond to emails. I respond within a day, at the most two days. I, even if the other person takes three days to a week to two weeks to respond to me, I hold myself to a standard where I reply to emails very promptly. And why do I do that? I want to appear thoughtful, considerate, responsible, mature, kind, organized, like I have my shit together. I am working on this, and yet it's prized culturally to be a quick responder and at what cost. I'm not present to those around me. I'm anxious about my inbox filling up and I'm responding with an underlying motive that is out of alignment with who and how I want to be in the world, which is an interdependent, compassionate, self-loving codependent diamond. Codependent diamonds don't necessarily respond to emails within one to two days, especially if it's not urgent. Now, let's look at the characteristics with an anecdote from my own life. To review, we begin with niceties. We do too much. We do too little. We apologize or have an apologetic tone. We add smiley faces. We take too long to write the email. We follow up and we respond promptly, hyper promptly. It was July of last year. I had been invited to lunch by someone who Without going into detail, I discerned I did not want to go to lunch with. I previously knew this person in my professional capacity as a therapist. I was not their therapist, but I was in a professional capacity as a therapist while interacting with them in a different 
form previously, I felt uncomfortable and unprofessional to meet with him in a social manner. However, you would not have gotten that from my initial email correspondence with him. In a few back and forth emails, I looked back and I began with niceties, like, happy Friday. I did too much. I offered multiple times to meet for a meal when he had asked me initially. I had an apologetic tone. I'm out of town with I added details and proof as to how I would be out of town forever. And then followed up with, can we plan on this date? Apologizing. I didn't have any emojis, so that's a relief. I did follow up. We tentatively set a time far off into the future and he didn't confirm. So I confirmed. But the whole time, I was hesitant. I was reluctant. And I had a a felt sense, a visceral sense that I did not want to have a social meal since we had previously connected and I wanted to maintain my professional role. When he responded with a possible time after I had followed up with him, after he didn't respond initially, it was clear that I did not want to meet. My thought was, Something's not right about this. My feeling was reluctant and uncomfortable. And my need was to not get a meal. And ultimately my main need was to maintain my professional role. And I took so long to convey that in an email. It took me calling my twin sister to provide her with context and get her assistance in composing my email. I looked, the whole email, including my name, is 65 words. And I estimate it took me 65 minutes to write and send that email. And when I sent the email, I remember sending it with the help of my sister who was on the phone with me and then putting my laptop far away, running away from the email. Why? No conflict. Conflict, no, no conflict. Avoid conflict, conflict, avoid it at all costs. Thankfully, my need to maintain my professional capacity was met. We did not meet for lunch. We have a cordial cordial interactions if and when we come across each other. And it was and is okay. If I had gone, if I hadn't expressed my needs in that email, I would have rejected and abandoned 
my inner self. And I sensed alignment by saying, I've changed my mind. You can too. Codependemies, emails are real. They're real. These are the common characteristics that make up the body of and the composition of our emails. I hope that by discussing these characteristics and by sharing a codependent email from my own life, you are becoming more conscious of your codependency when it comes to emailing. Excuse me. You are giving yourself compassion and context as to why you feel you must email this way. And you will stop playing small and start taking up some goddamn space and goddamn inbox. Let's conclude with some ways you can be an interdependent, codependent diamond when it comes to emails, okay? Seven encouragements. First, set a timer. Before you have to start an email conversation or when you have to respond to an email, I would encourage you to take a few breaths and discern how much time do I wanna to dedicate to this email? Five minutes, 10 minutes, 60 minutes. It's okay to designate an hour and by setting a limit, it will help you not take 60 minutes to write an email that ought to take five. Second, Niceties are nice, but not necessary. It's okay to send emails without them. I know as women, especially, we are bred to be thoughtful and kind when it comes to all of our interactions. I know for a fact my husband does not start his emails like this. There is a double standard, and yet we don't always have to meet that standard of being nice. Third, when it comes to doing too much or too little, I encourage you to provide two to three options, period. Two to three times, two to three activities, when it comes to creating plans or collaborating with others, you have to sense where your part ends and where theirs begins. Fourth, only apologize if and when you made a mistake or hurt someone. Other than that, don't apologize. Fifth, emojis are for enthusiasm and only enthusiasm. No emoji to cut the tension. Since tension, conflict, other people projecting their anger onto you, it's part of life. And it's about you not internalizing it. Tension, conflict, anger can come your way, and yet you have an emotional shield protecting you. Building up the strength of that shield is what matters most. Six, only follow up if you need to. The ball is in the recipient's court. It's their responsibility, it's their task, to take said ball and throw it back to you. Go live your life rather than follow up with people who evidently are out living their life. 
last but not least, seven, get feedback, input, and advice from trusted others. My sister was an ally and safe person to talk me through and help me with composing that email. Other people, not so much. Other people in my life maybe would have scoffed or wondered why I was agonizing about sending this email. Why are you so terrified? And it took talking with my sister and acknowledging, well, I'm worried I'll send it. And then he'll tell these people and these people think negatively of me. And I was able to sense that, well, what's worse? They're hearing about this and feeling negatively towards me, or again, me compromising my professional role. And it was the compromising that I didn't want to do. Getting help from other codependent dummies who are on their healing journey so they can provide compassion and empathy while you stop playing small and start taking up space in your inbox is what matters most. With that, we conclude this episode on the characteristics of a codependent dummy email. I hope this episode finds you well. And now I want you to go out there. I just said it, but I'm going to say it again. So you can stop playing small and start taking up space in your inbox. Thank you for being here. That is episode 83. And it's a wrap. Please, RRSS, R-R-S-S, rate, review, subscribe, and share this show. I was looking at the numbers. We have, we have a lot of listeners, so thank you. Thank you. Genuinely, thank you for being here. Thank you for sharing. Thank you for continuing to support We have close to 170 reviews on Apple Podcasts. Keep them coming. Thank you so much. I read every single one, just so you know. I noticed I, well, a request. So I noticed I only have 11 ratings on Spotify. So for you Spotify users, I appreciate if you go into the show page and find rate the show button and add a rating. And for those of you who have Spotify, haven't listened to the podcast there, you can go find the show. You have to listen to an episode for 30 seconds, and then you can have access to rating the show. Thank you in advance for that um, token of appreciation. If you are needing more, than just these episodes to combat your codependency, here are some additional options and resources. First, you can get a copy of The Confiding Codependent Dummy, 30 Days of Journaling Prompts for a Less Codependent and More Conscious You. That's at codependentdummy.com forward slash tools for healing. Also on the website, you can download the Self-Validation Challenge is a free 30-day guide to providing yourself with all the validation you seek from others to yourself. And that's at codependummy.com forward slash challenge. Also, if you're wanting to dive into your codependency deep, deep, deep down, get to the root and pull that shit out, I can offer that one-on-one. So please email me, marissa at codependummy.com to find out more. Last but not least, I don't have ads for this show. If you've noticed, and while the show is free, 
certain content is free, there is a cost. I am including a link in the show notes for you to make a one-time donation to the show via our PayPal link, our PayPal button, which will be in the show notes. I appreciate your donation. Thank you so much. I will see you next week. Marissa, out. Hey girl, it's Marissa again. I'm not like a regular podcaster. I'm a cool podcaster, right? Thank you for listening and staying till the end. You can find me on Instagram at Therapy with Marissa. Email me, marissa at codependummy.com. Check out codependummy.com for more information on the show. And baby girl, a subscribe, rating, and review would be much appreciated. Till next time, I want you to remember... If you are feeling unseen, I see you. If you are feeling unheard, I hear you. And if you think that you don't matter, know that you matter to me. I want you to go out there so you can stop playing small and start taking up space, you dummy. And now, the disclaimer. Girl... This is not therapy, and I am not your therapist. This podcast is designed to provide accurate and authoritative information in regards to the subject matter covered. It is given with the understanding that neither the host, publisher, or guests are rendering any legal, clinical, or other professional service. If you want or need a professional, please find one.